Hi, my name is Roberto. Uh, I work at Still Point uh, in London. Uh, I am the community, um, community development manager. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Still Point. So, Still Point uh, was uh, founded by therapists to share ideas about uh, clinical psychology, uh, what clinical psychology has to offer. Um, and, and now uh, Silpun has grown to an international um, organization uh, and our mission is to explore um, our world through uh, psychology uh, related disciplines um, and basically um, we do like this kind of events to yeah like basically explore um, every day um, things you know life so um about tonight um we encourage you to participate this is this is what it's it's about to um get to um hear your perspective um uh, we have uh, two um um guests uh, joining me and um, otherwise this will be a car crash uh, but we have um alex um, uh, who is joining us uh, from London. London. And uh, Julian as well, uh, who's in Berlin. Um, and I'll let you introduce yourself, uh, Alex. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alex White. I'm a counselor. I'm a counselor, actually, an integrative counselor coach. <laughs> Um, and I uh, work in private practice. I mostly focus on working with issues around sex and relationships and also domestic abuse and sexual violence, mostly with, um, with individuals. So I don't work with couples and with women and LGBT people. Uh, some of my clients are non-monogamous or have experiences with non-monogamy. Um, but I'm kind of coming at this conversation today from much more actually my personal experience, which is that I've been non monogamous in non monogamous. Blah, that's going to be tricky to say after a while <laughs> in non monogamous relationships uh, since I was 20, really. So for kind of basically all of my adult life relationships have been um, involving non monogamy um, and I'm 32 now. So that's actually been quite a while. Um, so, and it's, you know, I've, I've done a lot of therapy myself. I've got a lot of experiences of talking to therapists and practitioners about my relationships and talking to my friends, pretty much quite a lot of my social circle are non-monogamous to one degree or another and talking about them, about their experiences of going to therapy, going to counseling and talking about their lives and relationships and trying to find therapists who can at least understand or be aware of or be sort of open and friendly to the way that their relationships are set up. So it's something that I, I think about a lot. I think a lot about sex and relationships. Generally, I can't really get away from it. But it's one of my favorite topics. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here and to talk to everyone about it. Um, is there is there anything else that I should add, Roberta? I think that's a wonderful introduction, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, Julian. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Julian. I'm uh, based in Berlin, a member of Steelpoint uh, since March of this year, I guess. Um, yeah, I've been dealing with uh, the topic of open relationships for, for years already. Like a lot of the things that you said, Alex, are also uh, suitable for me. Um, I'm gay. I'm in a yeah, non-monogamous open relationship with my boyfriend. Um, but yeah, this is um, like my personal experience is uh, is shorter than my uh, that I'm that me um, being interested in the topic. Like this has been going on for years because also my my environment is quite queer and lots of like most of my friends are are in non monogamous relationships. And yeah, I'm also a psychodynamic therapist, still in training, and I also did a lot of therapy, which is part of my training. And there I also talk about these experiences and I find it quite quite helpful to have this space and um, yeah I would also be happy if, if uh, this would be 
a general thing in therapies that yeah people can, can feel free to talk about um yeah being uh, beyond the norm in terms of relationships thank you perfect thank uh thank you very much julian and um, and uh, welcome both um so um first i want to check uh like uh, about in the room like um who is familiar with the term um like you probably uh, hear like open relationship or uh, non-monogamy um or um, even polyamorous like maybe i think all of them have the might have different meanings but uh, are you familiar with with the term like is it um yeah like what does the room um like aaron aaron said yes good yeah felicity yeah so it seems like yeah we have a few um uh a few thumbs up so it seems like uh is familiar and Aaron do you want to uh, say something yeah I want to say that I can't put my virtual hand down so <laughs> ignore me <laughs> okay okay uh, thank you for your contribution um, and um, okay well why did we decide to talk about uh, open relationships uh, really um, I propose this uh, topic to to still point because I I was in an open relationship for a bit, and the thought also like has like was in my head for a long time, um, and uh, I, I I saw myself like talking to my therapist about my open relationship, talking to my friends, talking like and but also really not getting any um kind of like the real deal about open relationships like you know like not even uh, i know friends that are in open relationships and but also i i never felt comfortable enough to be like so do you feel jealous or do you feel like blah, blah. so i think facilitating a space like this um it felt necessary so here we are talking about open relationships um so I want to check first with, like, I don't know if you, Alex or Julian, do you have uh, an answer for this, but like, is it the same open relationships and polyamory or consensual non-monogamy? I think it's kind of depends on who you ask. I mean, certainly I can talk about kind of my understanding of those words. I'd be interested then to hear what Julian sort of says about this but i i use non-monogamy as like it's an umbrella term so it kind of is like any relationship where there isn't sort of sexual or romantic exclusivity and in some ways that's quite broad because relationships are so different even when you do have sexual exclusivity emotional exclusivity is like what does that even mean um and then within that i know that people may use open relationship to refer to something that's polyamorous which usually for people means like multiple um like romantic relationships love relationships maybe serious like long-term you know life anchoring or sort of domestic partnerships whereas open relationships for some people might mean they're in a, a serious relationship with one partner, but then have other relationships that are more casual or less committed or don't involve domesticity or marriage or kids or, you know, whatever sort of serious or kind of anchoring might mean for someone. Um, I really like the term. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I quite like using the term non monogamy for me because my behavior, the structures of my relationships, what that doesn't doesn't mean has shifted for me over the years. It shifts depending on what I need. It shifts depending on who my partners are. It shifts depending on what's happening in the world, like in global pandemics. Mm. And so non monogamy just always kind of enfolds and encompasses that and doesn't necessarily nod to anything specific. It's a bit of a non label label. Um, Lots of people also like consensual, uh, consensual non-monogamy or sort of ethical non-monogamy, which mm -hmm. I find really, it's interesting 
that there's that that urge to make it really clear that what we're doing is ethical so many things in life we don't necessarily feel the need to apply that label to and to be like to have to sort of defend and be like it's okay everyone i'm doing it the good way um so i find that that interesting but for some people it's really meaningful for them to be like i'm doing this with the you know openness and consent of all my partners because of course some non-monogamy is not with everyone's consent and that can be for a variety of reasons too um julian what's what's your your kind of take yeah well i i would agree with everything you said i think this thing with uh like pointing out that it's ethical is because the stereotype or the cliche of the non-monogamy is that it's like yeah that it's not um consensual um so it's like of a defense position um to the terms i think um from my experiences that open relationships is more used for um for relationships where the openness is is more sexual where where it's not so much about also having like intimate relationships um or romantic aspects in the relationship so much and that polyamorous is more used for the latter like that that people are having also yeah sexual and romantic relationships besides a primary partner um but some people might not even use the word primary partner they would say i have different partners Hmm. Um, okay, so someone in the, um, um, there's some comments in the chat, um, uh, Dr. Eva, uh, I have patients in dilemmas, they seek polyamory, uh, do it earlier than perhaps a good idea, then backtrack with huge consequences, okay, um, back to, uh, like, I, I suppose, um, like, splitting or some sort of like kind of like disagreements or something like that um let me just I, say words about that um mm -hmm. oh, everybody's uh, really good uh just as you you said um but but they don't put rules or they don't put uh like what does that really mean if one person has an open has a relationship in the partnership but the other doesn't suddenly one is thrown into loneliness while the other one's having a fantastic time, both the domestic and the whatever. Um, or if there's a, an emotional relationship by a text um, with a professional colleague, uh, within a professional, let's say a dancer couple, um, suddenly it throws everything off because the dance partnering is really uh, now uh, pushed into disarray, disarray and, and uh, there's, there's movement that wasn't expected. So it's almost as if it seemed like a great idea at one point, but then it no longer is within the partnership because they can't somehow navigate uh, the, the details of it. So I'll just stop there. Mm, thank you very much. Um... Someone uh, also said, uh, um, Mary, I like to use the term relationship punk for myself because relationship anarchy feels a bit used up by now. Um, I never heard of relationship punk, but I mean, it's also, or anarchy um, sounds um, new to me. I never heard before. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, I, I also wanted to kind of like go up, back a little bit and, 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 and be like, okay, um, how do I know that I want to be in an open relationship? Like, is it, is it, yeah, like, how do you start, like, like uh, is it for me, you know, like, um, is it just like maybe doing some internal work and like first instead of like before saying I think I I think I, I want to be in an open relationship? Is it like maybe why do I want an open relationship? Or um, what do you think? Is it like this uh, thought process? This like line process? I've I've got some thoughts. I could say some stuff, and then and then Julian might have some stuff to to add as well. I think that's it's a really good question because I think, um, like, 
when we're figuring out what we want in relationships, a huge amount of that is like, what, what do I internally desire? What am I kind of feeling like pushed towards or driven towards? What, what is exciting or compelling for me? And I think for a lot of people, they come into non-monogamy because of actually something external, like a situation that's been created, like um, what um, uh, Ava was saying about like, um, you know, sort of having an, an intense like dance partnership outside of a romantic relationship and that setting something off or a partner, you know, two people meeting and one of them saying, well, I have open relationships. So if you're interested in being with me, then you, you would need to be okay with that. How do you feel? Or you know, I, I started having uh, being non-monogamous myself because I'd um, been an exchange student in a different country. I'd been talking to people who were doing relationships very differently in new ways that I'd not encountered before. And I came back to the UK and said to my boyfriend at the time who had been in a long distance relationship, I was like, I think we should try this. And he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so so many external things can come in as well and so then you have that that sort of possibly possibly it's not a tension possibly everything lines up but possibly there is that tension of like what do i want in relationships what really excites me is it the idea of being with just this person and and nothing outside of that is it the idea of meeting loads of different people and being able to sort of explore? Is it the idea of perhaps having two people and being really excited about those two people? And, oh gosh, it's like answering that is like, how long is a piece of string? Um, but I do think it takes some internal work to separate, like there's this external stuff going on, there's this internal stuff going on, and how do I square that? And how do I explore that and find out what happens? Because it sounds like, a you know, sort of uh, mentioning, um, uh, Ava's clients again there you can put your toe in that water and find like oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be or this is shaken things up that I thought were mm. stable and were never going to change which is a yeah, bit, of, bit of a little bit of an illusion in relationships that nothing will change but it's sort of like non-monogamy can be a, a real uh, shake up to stuff that felt stable um, yeah that's that's kind of my my opening thoughts about that yeah, um, I also think that um, that there's again a big diversity here, a big variety. There might be people who just know I no, I cannot do this. It's, it's not my cup of tea. I really know myself here, um, and others would say the same thing about non monogamy. Non monogamy, um, like I I know I have these desires and I cannot, um, yeah, come to this monogamous agreement with it. Um, and then there's like these are processes that, that can change over your lifetime that <laughs> you suddenly find yourself, as you said, Alex, in a situation where, um, yeah, where things are different. Um, and in my case also, I think the long distance relationship opened the door. Um, and I, I don't know if, it, if my boyfriend and me at some point will, will live in the same city, if, if we might close the relationship, but um, I can also imagine that it's like, okay, now we had this experience and it, it kind of, yeah, also gave us lots of new um, insights. <laughs> um, so we will, maybe we will, yeah, we will just continue like this because, um, yeah, this is something that we, that we discovered together um, and that kind of, uh, yeah, deepened the relationship. Um, I, um, I was, I was when when Alex you were mentioning um, um, the yeah like kind of like the internal work that has been done and like um, in in my personal experience I you know like I think I found challenging the the like that bit where where it's like I think I know myself and it's like I even present myself to be like of course open relationships yes I'm, I'm forward thinking yes of course bring it on open relationships and then uh, when it happens and it's like oh actually this isn't uh, making me feel uncomfortable like but, but it's like internal like crisis because it's like but no no you can you can feel like that because you're very open-minded um, you know, like, and, and so I think that's when, like, I, I found it, like, kind of like, oh, um, 
what, what is it for me really or or am i just like going with like what other people you know like even like for example in 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 like apps and stuff like that you see a lot of uh like open relationships open relationships and and it almost feels like oh um maybe i should know about open relationships anyway that's kind of like my addition to this like internal um uh, thought process that that happens when when mm -hmm. considering open relationship yeah yeah and i i kind of i just want to add like i've in terms of how therapy has been a tool for me when i've been you know in my relationships and working out well, what's what do i want what's mine what's coming from the other person how much of what's coming from the other person can i accommodate and how much do i have to sort of say no to like having therapy and a therapist who kind of can help me always sort of return to myself and be like well what's happening in you when you think about this situation or when this thing happened to sort of really connect myself with and sort of bring those those desires or sort of needs or boundaries to the surface and then i often find i'm like i'm better armed to then go into a situation where i'm balancing that against someone else's needs and i think the situation that you're talking about roberto with that sense of like i want to be a particular type of person and I want to be seen and understood as that person. I want my partner to think of me as that person and to feel like there's a disconnect between that and what's going on inside it can be really complicated because there is a little bit of a, um, what's the word? There's, I think a little bit of a, a, like a link between the idea of like, oh, if you can do open relationships or non-monogamy that like you're a particular kind of person. I was like, mm, maybe, not necessarily. Like lots of people who are quite comfortable in open relationships may have all sorts of interesting flaws that come into contact with their partners in other ways. You know, I've got clients who the non-monogamy part of their lives, they're like, oh, it's fine. But they have other struggles within relationships, maybe around needs and boundaries. And it's it's always about that balance of knowing where your your stuff stops and your partner's stuff starts and then what you mm. you know, what you need to put first for you. And what that's like then prioritizing yourself and dealing with the disappointment that might come from your partner or the image shift it, it sort of creates in you. Mm. Um, which is why I've found therapy very useful for that to sort of always be turning back to myself to be like, well, what's happening here within mm -hmm. me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, when I was uh, going through the, like, the open relationship, uh, like, is it or not uh, i like therapy <laughs> was very um helpful um so yes uh i'm just gonna like read really quick some uh comments on the chat um so professionally i've seen uh only issues in couples that are hard to resolve but lead to greater authenticity in exploration personally i love the idea of polyamory but when i fall in love my energy moves to a single person also, given the intensity of my work, I find it hard to give the other a lot of time outside of professional intensity. What will happen if there are two others with whom I must split my free time? I mean, that's a uh, that, that, that's a, an interesting uh, question. Like like dividing the self, <laughs> like in in um. Or I think I relate this to, like, for example, if you if there's if you could see love as a cake or attention as a cake, how much cake do you give to, um, you know, each person? Do you give half and half, or is it like uh, is obviously it doesn't work like this, but um, I, I I relate uh, to to that um, question. Um, anyone wants to add some of this? Yeah, I like the saying. Um that love is not love is endless like you can love different people at the same time uh, but time is not <laughs> time is limited and time may have to be organized also um and also what comes a lot with uh yeah with opening relationships is communication i guess that you need to communicate a lot and this also needs time so um, because often you have to clarify things or to, yeah, to, to get through it emotionally. And um, if it's with different people, <laughs> of course, this needs, this needs space. Yeah. 
Um, Shane uh, said, uh, I think often it's hard. Oh, I think often the, the hard part is to come to a, an agreement with a partner on the right kind of level of open. Oh, often the concept of oh, what open means is not well aligned or explicitly, explicitly expressed. Um, um, okay, Shane, anything goes can be okay for one partner and definitely not for the other. Um, a nice starting point uh, I was taught by my ex boss for an agreement was not in my not in my hour bed, not in my face, not in my time. Uh, thank you, Will, for this. And kind of like, um, what do you think, um, Julian and Alex, about this um, agreement? Kind of like, um, kind of like rule setting. What do you think? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, it's really interesting. There's so much different advice out there around it. And um, I, oh, it's really tricky. It's so hard to say what will be useful for different people because for some people having like a, a particular line or a rule that they and their partner do not cross. I mean, that's essentially what a lot of, you know, what monogamous relationships are for a lot of people is there's a line you don't cross. And if you cross it, I'll be really unhappy. That will make me very uncomfortable. And that's not the relationship I want to have. So I think certainly having those, <clears throat> having those lines is, it's not even that it's important. It's like, we all have them. They will be there for all of us. And if you can identify yours and say to your partner, I've noticed that my line is here and uh, that I will right now, or maybe never feel comfortable with X, Y, or Z happening. It's like, if you know that and you can acknowledge it to yourself and to your partner, that's really, really valuable. I also like, there's also, I think a perspective of like, not like not having rules but kind of like knowing that things will shift and change over time we all shift and change over time the relationships will shift and change over the time over time and being able to kind of come back to your partner and say okay so we agreed not this thing but i'm realizing i desire this thing or actually you know could we try this thing and see how we feel about it and it's this, it feels like it's this continual kind of exploration together with another person and with multiple people of like, well, let's, let's walk over here together and see how that feels. Or, you know, let's, I'm going to go and do this thing and then come back and we're going to talk about it and we'll see. And it might make us unhappy. It might make one or both of us very upset or disappointed. And we're going to have to contend with that. Can we kind of contain that in each other? And then work out how to move forward when it turns out one of us has a very different line from the other. So rules can be interesting. It can be good to start with like a set of sort of pre-received rules, like a very sort of basic thing, like not in our bed or something, because then you kind of think, well, that's, you know, mm. uh, we'll start from there. But I think always knowing those those rules will probably change. You will probably need to talk through them and they might need to be reined in or they might need to be loosened up. And it's always going to be about weighing up what you can do or don't feel comfortable with in re with in a relationship, which again is true in any relationship. Where mm. do the benefits stop outweighing the stuff that's not quite working, and where does that line sit for you? Um, I think uh, uh, Ahmed uh, wants to contribute. Um, like Ahmed, please, uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, I have a question and I feel like the conversation um, is a lot about like if you are like in a partnership and what kind of partnership you want. And I, I also feel like I have the same question, but in a different sense. Um, I am single and I have been single for for last few years. And I feel that one of the challenges is that I often meet people who are um, polyamorous or non-monogamous who have a primary relationship. So they have a, a main partner or uh, yeah, primary partner in the relationship. 
um, and in a way, I'm not always kind of like comfortable with that situation. Sometimes I, I kind of opened myself up and I kind of opened up myself to dating people who have a primary partner. So I, I feel like it's just a little bit, little bit different kind of like constellation when you're kind of like more of like the single person and trying to kind of like navigate that kind of already existing dynamic. And that also comes with my own questions about my own identity, like am I that kind of person or not? And, and it also comes with like maybe other kind of like terminology, like there is this kind of like homebreaker slash homemaker kind of thing of like, are you helping the partner, like a primary partner stay in the relationship because you're kind of like this kind of sidekick kind of thing? Um, or, um, are, yeah, because my, and also my, in my history, um, one time they left their primary partners and I became the primary partner. So did I kind of like break it? Like, I, and they never really shared like the reasons why that happened, but so, um, so I'm kind of always kind of like confused with this kind of question. And I wanted to throw it out there um, because there's a very interesting contributions being made. Thank you, uh, man. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's interesting. Like, I no normally, I, I was kind of like thinking of open relationship, but also like in a in a couple way, like not I, I, as being, for example, the um, like the sec the other link, um, the additional link uh, on on the on any side of of uh, a couple or um, so. Uh, thank you for for sharing. Um, Ahmed, I probably don't have clear the question. Will you repeat it? No, maybe. maybe it was a, do you want to add something? Or? I, I, yeah, I kind of just, I feel like I got a handle a little bit of, of the, the um, uh, question that um, Ahmed had. Um, so I, I'll try and answer it and hopefully it was the right thing. Um, but um, I think, I mean, I think that raises a really difficult question because if, yeah, if you're a single person and you're dating within non-monogamous circles, you're going to meet lots of people who are in relationships and actually lots of people for a whole host of emotional and practical reasons would like to have a serious partner who perhaps is someone that they live with or raise children with or marry or have legal or financial bonds to whatever um, or who they're like socially monogamous with so people around them know them to be monogamous but they are actually dating or sleeping with other people outside of the, that relationship but everyone that they meet has that already and may only really have space for one person like that in their life and then you meet people who are in serious uh, partnered relationships and you think, okay, well, I'll see where this goes. And then maybe you want more or maybe it shifts the dynamic. And it can be, it can be a real challenge because of course the alternative is, is that you, you date, generally you perhaps date in a mainstream space where you're going to meet people who are single. And then you say, well, actually I'd really like it if our relationship could open up in future and how does that person feel about that does that shut potential connections down it's uh it's a really tricky thing i mean i think it's perhaps tricky in the way that coming to any relationship knowing that there's a particular thing that you want whether that's like children or getting married or moving to a different country or having particular like sexual or kink desires or something where you're like at some point i'm going to need to say this is a deal breaker for me i need to put this on the table um and I think I don't have any advice beyond empathizing that it is it is challenging and you're having to kind of choose one way or another. There are more events, I think, now for kind of like you're single, but you're looking for a, like a non mainstream relationship. So the alternative dating game scene, especially if you're queer has more of that <laughs> like it might not necessarily help you too much, but it's um, it's a tricky thing. Um, um, thank you, Alex. Uh, Felicity, um, 
uh, shares. Uh, an important question might be how open people are about their open relationships um, with others. I feel there is still some discomfort or stigma about the whole thing out there in society as a whole. Uh, I know certain couples who are considering going open but worry about what others might think if they discover. Um, and it, it makes me think of, um, for example, open relationships in mainstream media and how, how is it perceived? How is it like even put into, like, into the people like um, um, <laughs> head? Uh, like for example, I, always, I was doing like a little bit of research and, um, and I found Louis Theroux. Are you familiar with Louis Theroux? Um, well, it's a documentary make, filmmaker um, and it's in the BBC. It's, it's quite like interesting the, the, the work that, that Louis does, but it, it has certain like kind of like moral charge or like, like it's a bit biased. And uh, it, it is primarily, it's actually focusing um, um, heterosexual uh, um, um, individuals. But I mean, it's in the BBC, you know, it's like in like mainstream and, and I think it could give a little bit of this, um, probably reinforce a little bit of stigma, even though, like of, of like, wanting to, to, to share. It might like put that, I, like the, the curiosity on people, but still like kind of like put a little bit of stigma. So um, yeah, I agree with, with uh, what you say, um, Felicity, and even David as well um, commented on this, open relationships seem to be more common in queer environments. Is it a matter of straight couples being more worried about stigma? And yeah, it seems like there's a, a common topic in here about stigma and within the straight community. I'd like to add something to the question of Felicity because I also find it an important aspect that uh, talking openly about it is is um, sometimes not so easy. Like first, you have to find your own language. In German, for example, um, there are two expressions, um, like the one for jealousy, which is "I versucht," um, and this always this concept of okay, as soon as my partner is having something with someone else, there's jealousy, um, which is true. It can it can rise, and you have to deal with it. But there can also be uh, something else, which could be a shared joy of this that. Um, me also finding pleasure in the fact that my partner is having pleasure with someone else, <laughs> that this can be a part of it, um, or that I just um, yeah feel a stronger bond to him when I when I feel this freedom that I can that he's he's enabling this uh, to me, and the other term is uh, fremdgehen, which is um, used for like when it's usually when it's betraying, like you go to someone strange, one of the partners goes to a stranger, fremd. Um, and then I heard people using the, the opposite term, bekannt gehen, which means like going to someone known, because the other one is aware of it, like they talked about it, maybe, yeah, they share also information about this person, because the other one feels more comfortable with it. So I'm, I'm responding to the to this fact that there is like yeah sometimes a lack of language also and but my impression is also that in in, in the media um, there's new narratives for this also perfect um uh jose um uh, wants to share uh, do you want to unmute yourself jose yes sure i don't know if you can hear me can you hear me that's funny to be um, so I have two questions that are quite personal, but I think it might be applicable. So uh, my name is Jose, I'm bisexual, and my girlfriend, she lives in French Guyana, uh, which is the other part of the world, and they're in a strict lockdown. During this time, in a long-distance relationship, we we'll have to explore an open relationship. We're currently doing that. But I feel like she uh, doesn't have the ability to explore as much as I do, since I live in London. And like, how do you deal with unbalanced relationship, and especially if that brings guilt to one of the parts of the open relationship. Um, and then the second one is, uh, what do you think it's the line between an open relationship and a polyamorous relationship? I feel it's quite easy to cross from one to another and how can you establish boundaries uh, between both of them and 
how do you know which one applies to you and to your partner? I, I know I, I know there's a lot of questions, but maybe you can give me an insight about it. Please, uh, who wants to go, Alex, Julian? I can I can have a go. Um, so the imbalance, I mean, it's a really good question because it comes up um, so much. And I mean, I'm like, I'm currently in a relationship with someone who lives with another partner. So at points during lockdown, I wasn't seeing, I was seeing my flatmates, but I really wasn't seeing anyone. I wasn't able to have um, physical contact with my partner. We were going for a lot of walks. Uh, whereas he lived with someone and, you know, was able to have physical contact with them. And um, I wonder if at times he perhaps struggled with feeling guilty. And I struggled, I at times was like, hmm, I really wish we could have physical contact because if nothing else, I know that you're able to go home and have that. And that's sort of, you know, it's a it's a it's a difficult kind of tension to manage. I found that that what certainly has gotten me through that is finding the the ways to um, for to be shown that I am I'm important and special. If if that feels like that that like that, there's a bit of an imbalance somewhere to be like to find ways that your partner knows from you that she, that you find her important and special. Uh, in your life that you have that she has that central place for you and that she can receive that that she's hearing those ways and she you know that you're sort of speaking the same language I want to reference the love languages but I think it's a bit more a bit more complicated than that but like finding those ways whether that's subtle stuff like the way that you look at each other or how you spend time together or more clear stuff like verbal or what kind of like sexual stuff that the two of you do together long distance that's a bit trickier but it might sort of you know add some element of specialness if there's new or, or fun things you try together that are just for the two of you for now um so that's one set of ideas there but like just sort of you know always under like uh what's it adding that little safety net of sort of confidence of like you're very important to me yeah there's imbalances there's always going to be times where there's imbalances in relationships even if you're monogamous partner spends all their time at work and their work's really important to them you're going to want to know am i important to and it's an okay question to ask and a good thing to answer and figure out how to answer that um and i've forgotten what your second question was <laughs> Uh, I can I can refresh it. It was regarding like the limits between open relationship and polyamorous relationship, and how do you know which one applies to you, and how do you don't cross between those like that limit? I think it's quite easy to. Mm. I think having conversations where you're happy to really explicitly say, not like oh I think this you know if you did something more polyamorous I'd be uncomfortable, but say what does that mean to you. Does that mean particular feelings? Does that, you know, you, you can't control someone else's feelings, but you can say, when you notice these feelings, I think I'd like us to have a conversation. Does it mean particular activities? How much time you spend together meeting each other's, like meeting family, meeting friends, talking in particular ways, you know, and it's not like you're necessarily being controlling you're just saying these are the boundaries i've noticed how do you feel about them but when your partner or you say uh, i'd feel a bit bad if you know uh, this person became really important to you really be like what does that mean and be really clear about it and when you notice that you feel uncomfortable saying what that means because maybe you're like oh what if my partner comes back going oh, that's very you're very limited there or, you know, oh, how could you control me in this? Way? I don't know, whatever worries kind of come up internally in you when you're like, I need to communicate a boundary, noticing those, noticing the things that get in the way of that really clear, explicit communication so that you can be, you can be open with each other and risk disappointment and risk someone hearing something that they maybe didn't want to hear, but that you're, you're being open and honest about it and making that space safe for each other. I don't know if Julian has anything to, to add there. No, I was just thinking also in the comments, it's, it's uh, sometimes present uh, this topic of, um, of hierarchies or imbalance. Um, I mean, this is something that always has to be reflected in relationship, like in in what way are we not equal or if, what about the hierarchies in our relationship? For example, the, 
I mean, sometimes there's also arrangements where only one partner is allowed to do something um, outside of the relationship, um, which I personally find problematic. I mean, this can also be a solution for for a couple, but um, yeah, I, I've seen this a lot, and I, I often it often pointed to me to to something to a conflict that was not solved inside the relationship. And this was a way to try to solve it. Um, and it often didn't went well. So, um, yeah, I think um, it's a different thing than, than an open relationship where one partner is, is doing something and the other is not because he's not feeling the, the urge or the need or the wish right now. Um, but um when it comes to okay one one side is just doing it to hold the other or yeah i think here it becomes problematic um i hope that um uh, solved the question uh jose um i'm gonna just like uh, read uh, some read some something that it's in the chat um uh, one good way with long distance open relationship is to ensure that you reserve time for a video meeting uh, with big time zone difference. It kind of needs to be planned. Yes. Um, from my experience working with couples uh, of all possible gender combinations, um, when it comes to share the partner with thirds, fourth, or many more, no matter how this is defined, open polyamory or others, the fear of suffering loss is always around sooner or later. That's true. Um, and uh, the problem is that there are no guarantees, things can change. This is why I move away from myself, from uh, her, I, her, I can pronounce it, um, her, her higher cold style. It doesn't fit well with my lifestyle, yes. Um, okay, just, uh, I'm gonna move to another um, thing, but bef uh, before I move, I would just wanna tell you that there will be an opportunity. I'm gonna stop the video recording in 20 minutes. So people that uh, feel a little bit like, shy about um, sharing or something, we will have like 20 minutes to uh, continue the conversation without being recorded. Um, and um, what else? So, um, okay, one, one more thing before we move. So I was just gonna say something that, I don't know if it happens also in uh, within the queer environments or more like kind of like uh, probably male gay um, um, uh, individuals it happened to me but a uh, competition so it's it's not really just on balance but it's if you do I do and I do maybe if you do one I do two and if you do two I do four you know it's like I think there's a little bit of, um, it's not really like jealousy, but it's like FOMO or something like that, like fear of missing out. Uh, so what do you think of that? Anyone? I think um, that, that sort of thing that you're talking about, I find that when I notice that in myself, mm -hmm. where I know my partner or partners are having particular experiences and I'm not having them Oof. and I'm feeling a sense of like loss or uh, one, one down, you know, I'm like, oh, am I missing something? To me, that's a, especially if it then makes me want to be like, oh, I have to get on dating websites. I have to like go out to parties and meet people, you know, like a, like a, almost like an automatic, like urgency to me. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling vulnerable. Yes. <laughs> I'm noticing that risk, that risk of like, I might get hurt. I might lose this thing. That's really important to me. And I find it really helps me to separate what's really happening, which is my you know the literal thing is my partner's been on a, a few more dates recently that might change they might be busier at work and that might shift back or you know or whatever um and also noticing like how like that that's separate kind of you know that's the facts of the situation and doesn't it, it automatically like lead it's kind of a type of catastrophizing like it's like ah and then this will happen this will happen this will happen i'll be alone 
or I'll be hurt or I'll be taken advantage of and I have to shore up my end of things. So it's sort of separating that that response I'm having from what's actually happening. Mm. But also noticing that if that becomes like a recurring thing, because actually it's really just very useful and very safe for me to be able to know like broadly me and my partner are having similar kind of experiences and there isn't too much uh, tension being created by very different lifestyles. If that's just important for me, then that is a, an opportunity to sit down with my partner and be like, how do you feel about this? Because I find every time it happens, it's hard going on me. How do you feel? And my partner might be like, this stuff's super important to me. I'm going to do it regardless. What can we do to help this feel better within our relationship? You know, how can we address that vulnerability, essentially, as opposed to I should stop what I'm doing? It's like, how can we help make this feel safer? Or my partner might come back and be like, you know, I, I want the same thing, too. I would much rather this didn't create tension. I'm happy to rein things in. So it kind of it depends on like what the other partner's wanting to. But to me, I'm always like, oh, there's there's a need there. I'm having I'm having vulnerability. I'm having the vulnerabilities. God damn it. Why are they still here? <laughs> yes. Um, basically, I couldn't handle the vulnerability and decided to end the relationship. Um, but um, yeah, I think yeah, like it was like uh, a lot for a moment and like now that I think about, about, about it like kind of like think um, back I was like okay you just needed to chill and like like for a bit like I, I, I needed that to to like see it from another perspective but I yeah it was it, it was just uh, a little bit of uh, sharing. <laughs> mm. I mean I, I like I'm I'm hopefully not making what I'm describing sound easy or simple because it's, it's not coming to terms with your own vulnerability. And sometimes if you're in a situation where you're repeatedly being like, feeling like you're being sort of left to float out into the deep end, it might not be like a thing your partner's doing to you, but it might be a sign that like, that's just not the right situation. Mm -hmm. Too much vulnerability, like we need stable ground. Mm -hmm. No one can cope with too much vulnerability. Yeah, I think it was, it was something like that. It was a lot of, um, it, it, I just realized that it, it wasn't the right thing for me at that particular moment. But um, so, yeah, so and this is, yeah, go, Julian. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's also important to know that the rules that we talked about, that they are like, they built the frame of it, but there can, there will still be vulnerability. <laughs> so, and it's also important to, to give space to this, not to say like, well, but we defined the rules and now I stick to the rules. So what's your problem? <laughs> That's not how it works. There always needs to be a space to share this. And you also need to have the trust that you can share it and be ready to share it. Yes, that's true. Um, and so now I'm, I'm going to move so, to some, um, uh, how is it a free association or uh, so I'm gonna just put um, I'm gonna say some words and members uh, in the um, uh, in the room are welcome to just drop a word in the chat or maybe if you want to unmute and say it um, um, so they're quite intense uh, so it's um, obviously within the frame of open relationship. Uh, what will you say about the word love? And we also welcome silence, it's, it's okay to... Uh, someone said understanding. Uh, plenty to go around, good. Um, uh, great. If, if you can get it, free flowing, good. Mm. Uh, I, um, Kristen said everything, the vulnerability issue, um, I fundamental to make any kind of relationship work for the benefit of all persons involved. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Um, so I also have put like um, expectations. What do you think of like um, expectations? 
killer. Hmm. I like your um <laughs> your relations, uh, Helen. <laughs> uh, disappointment, realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, expectation management, scary. And expectations will change. Okay, interesting. So then projections. Any projections? Not really. I think that was a difficult one. Um, oh, projections. Uh, anything outside of it? Always present. Okay. Um, I, compersion, have you heard of that term, compersion? I actually, I'm gonna like make a pause on this one and basically, uh, Alex or Julian, do you wanna share if you know the concept of compersion? Is it compersion? Mm -hmm. I, I saw it on your list, but I never heard it. Mm -hmm. I also couldn't find it, in the, couldn't find it in the dictionary. <laughs> I, I think it might be a, like, a, like a new word or something. Um, I, I think it is a new word. So it's um, it's like uh, it's the pleasure or like enjoyment or warm feelings that you might feel knowing that your partner is enjoying themselves with someone else. Um, sort of, I guess, I think it's meant to be kind of like in in an opposite of jealousy. And it's I exactly know... the term that I spoke about in German. In German, it's called we would call it Mitfreude which is like with joy or shared joy. Mm, but yeah, mm. see, so you need a new language and then you yes. have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's really interesting. I, well, the reason I think it's interesting is because I have conversations with people where I think they think it's like, they're like a very advanced human being if they experience lots of compersion. And obviously <laughs> it's lovely if people do like, Good for you. That really like greases the wheels. If you're like, oh, my partner's out on a date and I'm just delighted about <laughs> it. I always, I, my sort of, um, I think my, my rule for myself with compersion is like, if I feel it, that's great, but it's like the cherry on top. It's not the cake. It's, mm. it's the bonus. But if I just feel like fine, cool partners out on a date, I'm doing something else tonight, whatever I'm happy that's all i need but compersion it's it's lovely and it's it's a nice way of um it's an interesting way i think to compare romantic and sexual relationships and our expectations around them with some of the expectations that we have around things like friendships and other situations where it's very expected that if your friends experience good things you will feel good things about that sometimes Maybe you might feel a little bit jealous of friends, but then it's like, oh, how do we see friendships and relationships as different? And where where do they maybe sometimes feel similar? But it's a very common expectation that you're like, your friend got a new job, your friend's dating someone, your friend's happy, or you'll be, you would find that happy too. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes the expectation of the reverse in romantic and sexual relationships of like, if your partner's getting that somewhere else, as well as with you, that you would not feel good about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that kind of an interesting yeah. comparison. Yeah, yeah, it's jealousy and envy even like come, comes to my head. So, yeah. I also like what Miri wrote now. Um, I wouldn't pressure myself to feel anything like there shouldn't be pressure to feel this compersion, but also, yeah, no pressure to feel jealousy. This, this can also be an experience to notice, okay, wow, I should feel jealous maybe, or it's expected for me to feel jealous now, but I don't. Uh, that's strange. And yeah, I had this experience and this was quite enlightening in a way yeah that's true like um yeah i remember like um talking about my open relationship with friends and it's like and are you okay with it like are you like are you not jealous like it, it is expected sometimes from from even your friends like um but yeah um um well, I have some others, but um, like betrayal and communication, um, um, but I'm gonna let the floor maybe ask some questions. I don't know if you anyone wants to share something, if it, you have any question, uh, sin, uh, share something in Spanish that I'm gonna quickly try to translate. 
Um, I think an open relationship demands uh, some sort of deconstruction in the form we relate to our environment um, from the fami like family environment to uh, affective relationships with other people. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't make sense like when I'm reading it. Um, Oh, sorry. No, I, I, like I should be able to translate better, but um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move from that. Thank you, Sin. Um, okay. Um, Christian um also said I really like to discuss all these terms: jealousy, envy, anger, and much more deeply. Do you want to share something, Christian? Or even any of you would like to take Yes, I do. I just think these terms are not helpful, let's say, let's put it that way, because they are too general in general. You never know what the one who's using that term really means, the person who's using the term in that particular moment in that particular constellation. And I really found it so helpful to talk with patients, namely with couples in therapy, really, really deeply, what do you mean? What does that mean? Talking about vulnerability, because this is for me like the densest term probably for all these things that then have kind of subcategories if you want to use that rather ugly word, but let's use categories um, within uh, relationship, within emotions of this kind in relationship called negative emotions. I don't think they are any negative, but you know that this often happens, that these emotions are called negative emotions. And I think they can be so utterly helpful and so utterly challenging for a couple, or for relations in general, and not just for couples. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, Mary said, yeah, I mostly hold it to Korski, Korski, I can pronounce it. Or CBS key or um, going after descriptiveness instead of simple labels, then the mapping of meaning does doesn't fail that badly. Um, Aaron wants to share something. Hi. Um, I, I think what I wanted to share was this. Um, you always get a definition of something in relation to its non-conventional partner in a sense. So, you know, you, 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 a heterosexuality was born outside homosexuality. Homosexuality came up and then heterosexuality became something thinkable. And I think monogamy becomes something thinkable in the face of non-monogamy. So the non-monogamous piece always is the, um, the one that we should be asking about, right? Like what's wrong with non-monogamy? Is there an attachment disorder there? Um, does this person not know how to, you know, securely attached to a single person. This is kind of classical psychoanalysis judgment stuff. And I guess what I just want to throw out there is the good part about psychoanalysis is its distinction between um, process and content, right? So a process can be anything and the content is the thing that sits on top of that. So yes, you can say that someone who's being non-monogamous is unwell because they can't make a secure attachment. And that might be true in some cases, but you could equally say that somebody is monogamous because they're defended against jealousy and insecurity. And you could have two insecure people grasping onto monogamy because they haven't dealt with their issues around jealousy and envy. So I just wanna play with that idea around process and content that you can't tell whether something is good or bad because it's monogamous or non-monogamous. And just because you choose non-monogamy because it's your cultural norm in the queer community or an urban community, whatever it is, I think it's something Alex said earlier that you have to really look inside and see if it's right for you because that's the only place you find if it's okay or not, right? It's not the content, it's the process. I'm doing this because I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm safe in doing that. Um, and you can put monogamy or non-monogamy as the answer to that, right? My monogamy is working for me or my non-monogamy is working for me or vice versa. So I just kind of wanted to kind of disrupt that idea that the, the secondary minority experience is the one that we need to be asking, is it pathological? 
which I don't think what, what we're doing here, but I think that is kind of culturally what happens. Alex? I just wanted to say quickly that that's really reminded me of a book that I'd love, love to recommend people if anyone's looking to like do more reading about this, which is um, a book called Rewriting the Rules by Meg John Barker, which talks broadly about the self and relationships and the idea that we, we, we sort of uh, flee to rules. We're sort of like, we want the set of rules. We want to know what's okay. Monogamy is okay. Non-monogamy is okay. Straight is okay. Queer is okay. Well, the, I, I can orient myself around this thing that sort of has been agreed as the normal thing or flee to the, the, the less normal or the strange or new thing. And rewriting the rules, the book is really about like, what are your internal rules? Figuring that out for yourself noticing your relationship to a particular norm and perhaps realizing you want to shift away from it or towards it in a particular aspect of your life and maybe not even all aspects of your life you might be like otherwise a very conventional person who has open relationships or you know someone who's extremely unconventional in some aspects but not in others but it's it's your own set because you there is not a set of rules for relationships you're always figuring out your own and then stuff changes and you've got to refigure them out again um which is you know what i think uh, i come back to like for me what what therapy is there for is to be like what's happening inside what are my rules so if anyone wants to do more reading i can't shout loudly enough about rewriting the rules and um, meg john barker's writing generally they're they're fantastic um alex do you think you could put it on the chat just uh we can then share it in the community um um uh, anybody else would like to share something um i think we have um i want to stop the recording now um and maybe we have like 20 minutes to um just conclusions and close up but i want to stop the recording now um